Thank you very much. Um, welcome to every, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Javier Redondo and I'm um, professor at the University of Zaragoza uh, in, in Spain and a frequent visitor at the Max Planck Institute of uh, Physics in Munich. And I've been uh, working very, uh, so perhaps the last uh, 10 years of my life in, in action cosmology, which doesn't make me the perfect uh, actually lecture for you uh, because I, my research has been uh, slightly biased. Nevertheless, uh, so I guess I'm just as good as anyone to teach you or to, to share with you the basics of action cosmology, which is the task uh, I endeavor here. So um, <clears throat> I was asked uh, to give to get, get you acquainted with uh, some of the aspects of uh, QCD action cosmology, and Enrico even gave me a nice list of, of topics to cover, which I think are the most, uh, are indeed the most relevant uh, in action cosmology. Uh, in uh, starting with uh, yeah, misalignment, uh, so ways in which actions can be the dark matter of the universe, uh, the, the two cosmological scenarios, pre and post inflationary uh, scenarios, um, thermal action production, time permitting, isochromatic fluctuations, cosmic strings and walls, action mini glasses, and action stars. So, and, and this is what I intend to cover somehow, but I'm going to do it in a very, um, I guess, unusual way. Uh, and uh, perhaps contrary to um, Enrico's wishes, I'm going to actually to start um, with uh, with the things that I'm not an expert on. Uh, so, so this is a very open lecture. So please, if you have any questions or comments, you just uh, you know jump onto me. Um, so, cosmology is just um, <clears throat> the study of the order in the universe, the uh, study of what what is but makes some sense in the universe as a whole. And action cosmology, or QCD action cosmology, uh, is the, should be the study of um, what is the role of the QCD action in this uh, order, cosmological order, right? Um, and uh, there are a few characteristics of the action which are key in, our, uh, which are key in, in the QCD action role in cosmology. Uh, <clears throat> and these, the, we are going to use them um, extensively in these lectures. So the first thing is that the uh, QCD action is a uh, first instance up to the Goldstone boson, right? Uh, the QCD action is related to this U1 symmetry, which is spontaneously broken at a very high energy scale. But we have uh, learned from, um, from Georg that the stars actually tell us that this uh, energy scale has to be slightly above uh, 10 to the eight uh, giga electron volts, right? So this is a huge energy scale and <clears throat> the spontaneous breaking of a global symmetry and this high energy scale produces the action as this to, to the, uh, well, um, Goldstone boson, which actually is not exactly a Goldstone boson, it's a pseudo Goldstone boson because this symmetry, uh, which is actually in nature, is also color anomalous uh, and so is violated by the color anomaly. And this is what gives the axon a mass and some uh, pseudo Gaussian boson properties. So um, to underline once more, uh, things that have been already presented, but perhaps not uh, sufficiently underlined. So the axion as a Gaussian boson, if you want, is, a, is an inhabitant of a low energy effective theory. Right, all the couplings of the action to standard model particles are of dimension uh, greater than four, so they don't belong to any renormalizable theory, and they are supposed to be uh, su uh, they are supposed to stop being valid or uh, perturbatively valid uh, when we prove these interactions at scales which are higher than the action decay constant. So something interesting has to happen uh, at energy scales of the action decay constant, and since in cosmology. Uh, just go so referring ourselves to uh, early enough in the in the evolution of the universe we can prove arbitrarily high energies we are going to be uh, sensitive or we are going to uh, prove uh, the ultraviolet theory uh, of QCD actions at least in some, some uh, scenarios and some aspects so um, in cosmology we will be proving a ultraviolet theory that has a um, u1 symmetry and uh, the spontaneous symmetry breaking will happen at some point uh, in the history of the universe. So we will be sensitive to ultraviolet and infrared uh, with respect to FA. Um, and something which is very important is that <clears throat> some aspect which is very important is that 
being this uh, energy scale so high, uh, the axions end up having a very small mass uh, compared to all the particles in the standard model. Um, and they have, and, and compared to particles in the standard model, they end up having feeble interactions, right? So these are the key aspects from which you can build uh, the axion cosmology, the impact of axion or the role of axions in cosmology. Um, the cosmology of, a QCD, of the QCD action is going to have a lot of things, things in common to any other pseudo Goldstone boson uh, of a symmetry, global symmetry, which is spontaneously broken at a very high energy scale, has a small mass and feeble interactions. Uh, and so actually one can generalize QCD axon cosmology to any other uh, to Nabu Goldstone cosmology, right? Like for instance, there are other um, candidates for um, exotic uh, Goldstone bosons beyond the standard model, like the, like the Majoran, for instance, that would be the Goldstone boson of, um, uh, of uh, lepton number spontaneous, uh, lepton number violation. And, and it's, going to, it's going to share many of the aspects that I'm going to say here for QCD axioms. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to start just by showing this plot that was inspired by the um, by the love of uh, your previous speaker, Georg Raffel, for grand unified spectra. Um, so here we, uh, together with Igor Rastorza, we, we made an attempt to build uh, a grand unified spectra of uh, axions in the universe. So this plot shows the energy density per unit uh, momentum of the different <clears throat> components of axions that we expect to have in the universe if axions do actually exist. And what you see here is <clears throat> some things that already Georg has mentioned. He's mentioned already the diffuse supernova axon background uh, and so axons from supernova and axons from the sun, right? So here, <clears throat> these axons are, uh, have energies of kilo electron volt uh, energies or mega electron volt energies, depending on the uh, temperature of the star. And they tend to be the dominant at very high momenta, right, at, at those uh, energies. But uh, as you go to smaller uh, momenta, which, uh, momenta related to the temperature of the universe, uh, you end up having, <clears throat> a com or you, you expect to have some axions that have been, uh, been thermally produced in the early universe. Some uh, axions that have been, oh, you don't have to, but uh, it's typical that you have some axions that have energies of the order of the temperature of the universe. And they are the dominant actually component at these, uh, at these frequencies, um, which are re yeah, related to the temperature of the universe, which in units of electron volt would be today something like 10 to the minus four. That's why the th uh, spectrum of thermal axions end up, will end up more or less uh, being exponentially suppressed uh, above this 10 to the minus four electron volt. And what you have here is also something very interesting that um, there can be a component of ultra cold uh, axions um, that can be the dark matter of the universe and that are uh, orders and orders of magnitude above this thermal, um, this thermal population, okay? So we are going to discuss mostly how cosmology produces these two components and how can they be so different. And uh, you can, if you want, bear in mind that it's actually, actually the most relevant uh, populations of, of axions that we expect to have in the, in the universe. And therefore, actually, they, also, uh, they are also giving us the, the better opportunity, I think, to some extent, to discover axions. Uh, being the most numerous populations, we can just, we are going to uh, focus our experiments on trying to detect uh, particularly cold dark matter axions uh, as a discovery channel and also as a means of identifying the dark matter of the universe. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So for the dark matter axions, would be conceivable uh, to think about the very detection. For the other cases, we have uh, options for very detection. Hmm. Yeah. It's pretty hopeless uh, for small uh, we have we have not been able to come up with any uh, scheme to detect uh, uh, dark radiation axioms. Unfortunately, there there could be some opportunity 
or at, at least the, the closest we have been uh, uh, if these dark radiation actions are not thermally produced, but are produced by the decay of some moduli in the early universe. Because these actions, they are slightly, so they, are, they, they can be more or less as numerous or they can have as much energy as the, um, as the dark radiation actions, but they can have uh, higher energies that would allow them to, com to convert into photons more efficiently, for instance. So at some point we were thinking about just using uh, YAXO. So YAXO in principle is a directional uh, experiment, but in this case, you would just point to, to nowhere and you would expect some counts, right? But and, and the numbers are not too far off, uh, but uh, but but not right there. So we are talking about um, I think uh, signals which are <clears throat> two or three orders of magnitude below the the sensitivity. So it, it's conceivable that a further generation experiment could actually improve those, but uh, but we have no idea of how to uh, access this directly, which is a pity. Uh, it is not unlike <clears throat> the case of, of thermal neutrinos, right? Of the thermal population of neutrinos, uh, which uh, is extremely complicated to detect. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, this one, you mean? Let me just answer in the, in, the, in the remaining part of the talk. So the, we, we go there exactly. So th these are already been mentioned by um, by Giovanni very fast. But I'm going to <clears throat> describe um, what do we expect. So how, how do we expect our universe to to be uh, to, to to allow the axiom to have some to have some impact in, in cosmology, right? And um, so when we have described to you the axions and the physics of, of axions, we have told you, okay, we have uh, this new particle uh, that it has a, a, a potential energy that is related to the QCD vacuum energy. And it has some interactions with the standard model particles. And the interactions with the standard model particles are the only way to connect somehow, well, are the most important and mo the most obvious way to connect the action with, uh, with our world, right? <clears throat> so, um, in the universe, if you if you uh, draw a typical storyline of the expansion of the oh, sorry of the story of the universe, we would have something like uh, uh, something like this line, which is um, consists on some period before inflation, uh, cosmological inflation, from which we don't know very much, and is not going to have a, a very important impact in what I'm going to say. Then uh, we shall certainly have some kind of uh, period of inflation. I think the alternatives are not so good uh, nowadays. So this period of inflation is a period in which the universe uh, expands uh, exponentially fast in time uh, so that the causal horizon actually gets out of, of um, so it grows beyond the local uh, um, uh, yeah, horizon. And, uh, and allows us to, to explain why the universe is actually so homogeneous and uh, so tropic, right? So this is, um, this would be cosmic inflation at the beginning of times. Then uh, we don't know exactly what happens, but at some point, uh, the energy that was localized in the inflaton field uh, has to convert into particles because uh, we certainly know, we have uh, indirect, evidence that the universe was actually radiation dominated at temperatures of uh, around five mega electron volts. So when the temperature was five mega electron volts, uh, the universe had been radiated, radiation dominated uh, to produce the right uh, helium abundance that we observed in the universe. And then uh, at a smaller temperature, say something like um, 100 uh, kilo electron volt, so be below one mega electron volt, the, the atoms that are left, oh, sorry, the nucleons that are left from the Big Bang, they combine into, uh, into the low mass atoms that actually are produced uh, in, in the, uh, are observed nowadays in the most pristine uh, uh, regions of the, of the universe. So, um, at very high temperature, protons and neutrons uh, are the only nucleons that can exist. But then at lower temperatures, protons and neutrons will combine to form uh, deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, uh, and so on. Uh, but this 
happens in a very, this can only be efficient in a very small range of temperatures around this uh, 70 kilo, kilo electron volt. And after that, no further nuclear reactions are produced uh, in the early universe. So in order to, you know, if since nowadays we, we observe, um, we can measure these primordial abundances with relatively good precision. Uh, in order to reproduce those observations, uh, we need uh, that these reaction, nuclear reactions take place in a radiation dominated universe. So the universe has been dominated by radiation and this um, radiation, what means? It means a relativistic plasma of, of uh, particles of the standard model, which means <clears throat> for those temperatures, photons, electrons, uh, and neutrinos. So these are the only particles that are uh, can be active in a plasma of a few mega electron volts. Okay. What happens before we don't know. So at some point, the energy of inflation should, should give uh, rise to radiation. But this uh, can happen in a, in a huge number of ways, right? And this is going to have a, a lot of impact to the predictions that we can make of the role of accents in cosmology. Um, much later. Um, <clears throat> So the density of so uh, radiation, density of radiation, um, uh, of course, with the expansion of the universe, redshifts less than uh, so uh, faster than any matter component, and uh, baryons and cold dark matter of the universe end up dominating the energy budget of the universe at the redshift of around four thousand. So when the universe is four thousand smaller than today, uh, and shortly after uh, the photons of this radiation um, stop having interactions, uh, effective interactions with the rest of the plasma and they are liberated. And the photons from this radiation, the primordial radiation are what we see today as the cosmic macro, back, cosmic macro background. Um, very good. So then, uh, so th this is a picture of, of uh, cosmology that fits best the observations that we have now. I'm assuming that you have so I, I'm being very fast here, but I'm assuming that you have some kind of knowledge about cosmology. Uh, if you don't, you can ask every, you can ask anything, right? Because I'm not going to be, I'm not going to give you much more uh, standard cosmology than this. Okay. So you have some uh, question, don't, don't hesitate. The important thing is that we know for sure that there was a period in which the universe was dominated in energy. So the most important energy, uh, so, uh, uh, component of the universe was a plasma of relativistic particles, uh, photons and all the particles that can be produced from photons. And um, since we know that standard model particles, in particular photons, gluons, etc., uh, have interactions with axions, then it's reasonable to expect that some of these particles, some of these standard model particles pro will produce some axions. Okay, so let's estimate um, how many axions are going to be produced in this epoch of radiation domination? So um, the most important, the most relevant production mechanism for producing axions are those that involve uh, the strong uh, interactions because uh, gauge couplings are larger and because axions preferably also couple or at least minimally couple to uh, QCD by definition. So let's just think of if you want that uh, we will have uh, some, um, as, as Giovanni said, some pion process that produces an axion or some gluon interactions that produce an axion. Um, the most important aspect of this production is actually not, not even the, the Feynman diagram, but the fact that all the interactions of the axion, um, because of the way of the axion enters into the Lagrangian, are suppressed by the axion decay constant. Uh, so this means that the, um, any amplitude of producing an axion is going to be suppressed by one of the uh, um, Axion decay constant, which means that the cross sections for producing axions are going to be suppressed by one over uh, FA squared. And um, well, <clears throat> this actually, so by a dimension analysis, we are done with, uh, with the typical scaling of the cross section. Beyond some uh, gauge couplings here, uh, the cross sections of producing axions, are, they need to be one over FA squared, and that's it. So, uh, <clears throat> so how, how do we connect this with the um, action production rate? So the action production rate is, um, as Giovanni was advancing, so it's, uh, it can be related to, the, to a thermal average 
uh, to a thermal average of the number of initial number density of initial particles uh, times the cross section for producing axions. And here I'm just yeah you know, writing uh, question marks that this can be any particle in the initial state, any particle in the final state. Uh, and this density, so this n, uh, small n, is the number density of some of the initial particles in the initial state. And since this is a relativistic plasma, the number density of particles is given by uh, the only scale in the problem, which is the, the temperature. Um, number density has units of energy to the minus, uh, sorry, energy to the three, and thus uh, the typical num uh, number density of uh, particles in a thermal plasma is just n cube. Uh, and the typical velocity of particles in a relativistic plasma is one. So then typically you get something like this. So the rate of project production of axioms, it has to be something like T cube divided by FA squared. So super simple, right? And now <clears throat> if you want to know whether this uh, rate of producing axioms is actually effective or not, we have to compare it with uh, the rate at which the universe expands. And the, the rationale behind this is very simple. So um, the expansion, so the, this um, radiation domination epoch works as <clears throat> like this. So we have a plasma of relativistic particles. And as the universe expands, the momentum of these particles is redshifting, right? But at the same time, these interactions are, uh, um, so the, sorry, these particles are interacting a lot in such a way that at any time, they, so they, the interactions are so effective that they are that the plasma is kept at uh, local thermodynamic equilibrium, right? So it's like an adiabatic expansion of, of a gas, right? But the temperature is decreasing slowly, uh, but the particles are always at thermal equilibrium or quasi thermal equilibrium. Um, <clears throat> now, so the interactions of the, so if you want to have any particle, in, in thermal contact, strong thermal contact with this plasma, you have to have at least a few interactions. So you have to have a few interactions uh, per Hubble time, which is the time that it takes the universe to, to expand by a factor of two or something like this, right? Uh, because otherwise the particles or the, the new, the axion will not be able to adjust to the changes of, of temperature, okay? So uh, since the temperature is decreasing, with the scale, so yeah, uh, let me just write this um, in a simple way. So this is uh, standard cosmology. In standard cosmology, the expansion of, of the universe is parameterized by one function, which is called the scale factor. Very often you, you write the scale factor as A of T, but here we are, we are reserving the A for the axiom. So I'm going to write A, uh, right? Uh, so R, tells me what is the, the physical distance between two points in, in moving coordinates in a universe uh, that is expanding. So if I have, have two particles that are separated by moving coordinates um, by a distance dc, the physical distance between these two points is uh, the, the moving coordinate distance, which we typically choose to be the distance that these particles would have today, multiplied by the scale factor. And we define the Hubble rate or the expansion rate as the time derivative of the scale factor divided by the scale factor, which tells you uh, effectively, which is this corresponds to one over some particular time, which is typically the time that it takes the universe to double its size, right? So, um, so if the number of interactions that the, the, uh, this action is experiencing, the number of actions produced or the number of actions absorbed is much, per unit time is much faster than this typical time in which the universe expands by a factor of two. Uh, so then we will have an axiom that is able to be in, in thermal equilibrium with, the, with this uh, plasma. Um, which is what happens actually with the particles of the standard model. For the particles of the standard model, the rate of interaction of production and destruction of these particles is much, much faster typically than the rate of expansion of the universe. And so all these particles are in thermal contact in between themselves. So the action will also 
form part of this thermal population. If uh, gamma is much larger than the uh, Hubble expansion rate, and um, and the Friedman equation, which is essentially uh, the um, which is the equation that tells us uh, how um, the expansion is related to to the energy density. Um, please tell me if you don't know this. Uh, so uh, the, the first Friedman equation, which is you know, Friedman equation, tells me how uh, a universe gravitates essentially, and it uh, is telling me that the Hubble rate squared is proportional to the energy density with some constant constants we have to do with the uh, with the gravitational constant, Newton's constant of gravity, and the energy density of the universe. So this equation essentially tells me that um, in a universe without curvature, the expansion of the universe is related to the energy density. Yep. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. You're right. Here, there's the square root. <laughs> so the exactly from from this, um, we can write that this is eight pi uh, g divided by three. And the number, so the energy density of relativistic plasma can be written as pi squared divided by 30 multiplied by the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, which you write as g star uh, times the temperature to the four. So just uh, yeah, taking the square of this uh, is uh, the square root of, of g, of course. Very good. Um, very well. So we just uh, compare now the rate that we have that we can predict for particles for the axons to be absorbed or emitted because the inverse reaction has the same rate. Um, with the expansion of the universe, we reach the conclusion that uh, axons will be in thermal contact for a temperature that is uh, larger than Fa squared divided by Planck mass, where the Planck mass comes from, from uh, new, uh, the G Newton here. Uh, and this is very exciting, right? So if, if the temperature is sufficiently high in the universe, uh, the plasma, so the standard model particles in the, in the plasma will be able to produce a thermal population of axons, right? If not, not. Uh, so this puts a, a restriction on the cosmologies where we are going to have sufficiently abundant, abundant uh, production of axons. We need the heating temperature to be above this quantity. And this is what, what I'm assuming uh, now. If you, put it, uh, if you put it in numbers, just very naively, then you get something like this. For a value of A of 10 to the, 10, 10 to the 12 GB, which is the uh, typical value that also Giovanni was highlighting, um, we have <clears throat> that this critical temperature is of the order of 10 to the 5 GB, so which is uh, much higher than the temperature that for sure we know that the universe had, which is five MeV or so. So yeah, from, from what we know about the universe, we know that the maximum temperature of the universe or the reheating temperature of the universe has to be larger than five MeV. And this is because of BBN, as I was telling you. But, um, but it could be 10 MeV, or it could be one GV, and these axions would never thermalize, okay? Um, but okay, let's go on. Let's assume, why not, that this temperature actually was reached uh, after inflation. And, uh, and then we have this thermal population of axons. Now, how many axons do we have um, today? Well, the number of axons, once, you, once the, the axons th start to uh, thermalize, one, the, the number of reactions that take place um, in Hubble time is very, is very high. The axon population will, will reach uh, thermal thermal abundance uh, which maximizes the entropy and um, well as <clears throat> the most important thing that actually we can derive from this expression is that even if this axon population is produced at some very high temperature as the temperature drops down we will cross the critical temperature and this and the thermal axon population will decouple will freeze out so that will stop having will stop having contact with the uh, with, the, with the primordial plasma. So um, the axons will decouple at this uh, temperature. Now, uh, 
from this moment on, the number of actions will not, cannot change because actions have very weak self-interactions. And now I've showed you that the interactions with the standard model will be ineffective in changing the action number below this temperature. Hmm? Uh, does this mean that the kinetic and the chemical decoupling more or less uh, occurs at the same time? Or is there still some... Um, I'm assuming that this is the case. Uh, and and I think this is uh, this is typically the case for the for the simplest action models that I'm considering. Mm -hmm. Essentially, actions um, they they have negligible self interactions. So uh, once they decouple from the standard model, they decouple from everything. Uh, at least this is yeah exactly. So this is the case when this T decoupling is far away from the ultraviolet case. Uh, ultraviolet scale of physics. But you see, if, if uh, FA is very close to the Planck scale, then all these scales get tangled within, within each other. And then you can have particles of the ultraviolet theory that are, uh, that are still present at these, uh, at these uh, scales. And this can complicate the whole thing. Very good. Uh, so under these assumptions, the number uh, density of actions today can be calculated as the number density of actions when they decouple from the primordial path and multiplied by the, uh, by the dilution of the universe from that moment until today. So essentially, <clears throat> since the number of actions is, has to be conserved, but we are changing the volume, we are expanding. So the, the density just decreases as one over the volume. Right? And if the volume is expanding as one over R cube, then uh, we have this factor. And how, do, how, how can we calculate this factor? Well, we can use the fact that uh, in a plasma in thermal equilibrium, the entropy uh, is conserved. And, um, and the entropy can be written as uh, two times pi squared 45, the number of relativistic entropy degrees of freedom multiply by T cube, multiply by R cube. So this is the, the commoving entropy. And this is a constant in a universe that is in thermal contact, uh, in a plasma that is in thermal contact. So this can be used to calculate the ratio of two uh, scale factors as the ratio of two temperatures, uh, taking into account this number of number of, of relativistic degrees of freedom, which is the number of species which are in thermal, which are thermally active. And so this, so if we do this, then <clears throat> note that the, the temperature of the coupling cancels uh, away. And what we get is just an expression that is just some number. Uh, the, the typical density is the temperature today. Okay. Uh, so the abundance of accidents today is the, is a density of photons today because this is a typical density of photons, the temperature cube today, uh, but is suppressed by the number of degrees of freedom that uh, the plasma had when the decoupling happened. Um, I think I have somewhere. Oh, yeah, here. here you have the uh, the number of degrees of freedom of the, of the plasma, of the standard model plasma as a function of temperature. And um, <clears throat> so if the temperature is very high, all the, degrees of the, all the degrees of freedom of the standard model are active in the plasma. All the degrees of freedom mean, means all the particles, right? Uh, and if you count all the particles that are in the standard model, you get, uh, with taking into account all the spin degrees of freedom. So uh, one Higgs, uh, three W bosons, right? With three polarizations, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the C boson, the eight gluons, et cetera, et cetera. You get to a number which is roughly uh, 107, right? This would be the number of relativistic degrees of freedom of the plasma uh, at a very high temperature. But as the temperature decreases, some of the particles of the standard model cease to be energetically uh, favorable. So of course, uh, plasma of uh, a, Gig electron volt temperature is not going to have many Higgs bosons because the, the mass of the Higgs boson is 100 uh, giga electron volt, right? So the density of Higgs bosons here will be very, very small. And here you will have only the degrees of freedom 
um, whose mass is below the temperature. So this is the function that we, these are the functions that we know. And uh, <clears throat> depending on the decoupling temperature of axions, uh, this suppression will be larger or smaller. Huh? Yep. Ah, oh, yeah, these are different uh, degrees of freedom because, but uh, it's irrelevant for the discussion, I think. But um, so this uh, blue color is the number of degrees of freedom that is relevant for the energy density, which is this G star. Uh, this uh, red is the number of degrees of freedom that is relevant for the entropy, which is slightly different, uh, or slightly different in particular during the phase, the phase transition. And uh, this is the, the number of degrees of freedom relative uh, or relevant for the heat uh, capacity of, of the plasma, um, the, the green line, but they are all very similar as you can see. What they are different, well, for instance, well, the, the, what, what is relevant uh, for the energy is, uh, is the temperature to the four, right? For the entropy is the temperature cube, um, so th this this involves um, a thermal average of uh, of a different function, um, and it's a momentum. Yeah, it's a momentum dependence. And and here, uh, so so par particles uh, in the standard model they, they they are not so in the plasma. Let's say the plasma is not an, an ideal plasma because particles have self interactions and these self interactions have also energy and have also pressure right so what enters uh, here in this graph is also the the interaction energy and the, the and the pressure in particular during the qcd phase transition um, this is this this is different because of course the the um, the interaction between hadrons and the interaction between um, gluons and and quarks is mo most intense here right that's why they start to they depart particularly around here so yeah so these are departures from an ideal uh, ideal plasma very good um so now we we, we, able, we were able to calculate the, the number density of axions that we will produce thermally and decoupled at, at uh, below the critical temperature. And we can estimate what, uh, well, so what, what is the role that these axons can have. And since the axons have a mass, uh, so these axons can be actually uh, dark matter, right? So what is the density of dark matter of these axons, which is just the, the, den the, the, the action mass uh, times the number density of axons. So each of the axons have, has a mass, has an energy which is given by the mass, uh, at least, so this well, this is the this is the dark matter density, uh, and then we we know how to calculate this, right? Uh, but we can so we can see immediately if we if we make a, a couple of numbers that this um, thermal dark matter can only be a subdominant component of the whole dark matter that we know exists, and this might be a little in, involved. Let me so you can you can take this as phase value, but I'm going to show you how can you uh, how can you see this if you have a some knowledge of, of uh, standard cosmology. So the, the radiation density today is essentially a temperature of the CMB, temperature of the photons uh, to the fourth power. Um, and uh, if you go back in time to the moment where radiation and matter weighted the same in the universe, this is what we call the moment of radi matter radiation equivalence. Um, uh, the radiation and, and matter was the same, but radiation and matter, they redshift with a, fac with a factor of uh, the scale factor difference. So uh, today, we, because of this argument, we know that the density of radiation today is equal to the density of matter today, divided by the redshift of uh, matter radiation equivalence. And this is something like 4,000. So we know that uh, today the amount of radiation is 4,000 times smaller than, uh, than the amount of matter, okay? Uh, simply because if we compress the universe by a factor of 4,000, uh, this guy increases 4,000 4, 4, yeah, 4, times more than the matter, okay? Uh, <clears throat> So then this is more or less 10 to the minus four times the, the matter density today. 
And the matter density today is about the critical density today. The critical density is um, the, of the essentially the energy density of the universe, whole the, of the whole universe today, right? And uh, the amount of dark matter is 30%. So that's, that's all right. Uh, now the density of axions is um, essentially T3 multiplied by the axion mass. Uh, so it is essentially the, the density of radiation multiplied by MA divided by T0 and suppressed by this number of degrees of freedom. Now, T0 is something like 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. And if you have followed the lectures of, of uh, Georg, this axion mass has to be essentially smaller than 60 milli, milli electron volt, not to violate astrophysical bounds, something like this, right? <clears throat> and therefore, you get here from this, from this expression, you get a factor of 600 at most, but here you get a suppression that is typically, that can be of the order of 30, 20, 60, 100, right? So this is uh, not able to compensate this 10 to the minus four, or uh, particularly with this suppression. So this means that this expression here has to be smaller than the critical density and therefore smaller than the dark matter density. But if you look at the numbers that are here, we are not so far off, right? We are not 11, order of, 11 orders of magnitude off. We are a few orders of magnitude off. So the amount of uh, action dark matter, if the action mass is close to the astrophysical limit, is not very far off from uh, the amount of, of, from the critical density today. Um, very good. So this is, uh, this was put up in this, in this plot, which shows actually the density, the dark matter density in thermal axions as a function of FA. Um, so here I've used um, yeah, the previous expressions to calculate the decoupling temperature and uh, use the, the, the number of degrees of freedom uh, to, to draw this line. And you see here something very interesting. So of course, uh, when FA decreases, the abundance increases because axons are strongly, more strongly coupled, and then they remain in thermal contact until later in the universe, and therefore they are less suppressed by this by this factor, right? So the <clears throat> the thermal density increases, uh, and uh, of course the axon mass increases in this direction. So actually, most of the increase is due to the axon mass. But at some point uh, before it reaches the dark matter density observed in the universe, which is of the order of one kilo electron volt per cubic centimeter, then uh, the axion mass becomes of the order of 20 electron volt. And this 20 electron volt is actually the, the mass for which the decay rate of axions starts to become comparable with the lifetime of the universe. And therefore the abundance of axions can never be, uh, can never be, can never reach uh, the, the full abundance of cold dark matter observed. Uh, just simply because here, axions decay too fast. Uh, so yeah, that's a prediction for thermal dark matter. And you will notice that here there's a range in which I, can, I couldn't draw the line, the blue line. And this is because uh, I don't know how to calculate uh, properly the, the axion production rate for a when the decoupling temperature is of the order of um, the QCD phase transition. Yes. Oh, so this is the this this is the cold dark matter abundance. So the, I, I, here I'm not I'm not calculating the energy density, but uh, but the relativist the non-relativistic energy density. So really the mass multiplied by the density. But this is not the dominant energy density for, for axions at this very small mass. Here you have the kinetic energy on top, you're right. Here the, here the mass dominates, and here the kinetic, uh, exactly. And this, I, I, go, I go to this now. I was focused mostly on the hot dark matter. Um, <clears throat> yep. This, these things, yeah, these things, has to, uh, um, it comes, this is the non-thermal production of, of uh, dark matter. So yeah, it comes a little bit later in the lecture. Very well. So um, 
The important thing for these thermal accents is that actually they are not cold dark matter. Uh, so they are they are dark matter, but they are not cold enough. And this you can um, you can verify very easily by just calculating the free streaming length, which is the distance that one of these accents uh, traverses from from its production moment or from the Big Bang until uh, the epoch of the CMB, more or less, right? Which, which, is, which is when we can measure uh, the anisotropies in, in the universe most precisely. So we can calculate what is the, the distance that, uh, or the co-moving distance that an, that an action has gone by just simply integrating the co-moving distance uh, per unit time, which is the velocity divided by scale factor. And we can write this if we want uh, in time or just in redshift as well, taking into account that redshift is um, one, yeah, it's related to the scale factor by this expression. Um, yeah. So we can write the, the, the integral like this. And the velocity of an action is just the momentum divided by the energy. The momentum is P, the energy is P squared, so the square root of P squared plus M squared. And the only thing that we have to take into account is that, of course, due to the expanse of the universe, the, uh, the moment of, arc, of accents is red shifting. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, yeah, the momentum of accents is becoming uh, smaller and smaller as uh, the universe expands. This can be parameterized by saying that the momentum of an action uh, is of the order of the temperature, as we, as we know already, by a, a, a parameterized by X, the X parameterizes how far off from the temperature are we. And then if we look back in time, so at high redshifts, the momentum increases by a factor of one plus C, right? So, uh, so this is a parameterization of the momentum of the axions. And we put this into this integral. Uh, and then uh, we have, well, we can do this integral very easily. This integral can be split in two parts. Uh, the integral until the time when accents become non-relativistic. So the accents uh, move relativistically uh, until the momentum is of the order of the mass, right? And <clears throat> until V uh, is slightly smaller than one. And this happens at the redshift, which is given by uh, the mass divided by this uh, X uh, T zero. Uh, and then when the accents become non-relativistic, uh, X is the is a parameter that tells you how how are you, so what, what is the momentum in relation to the temperature. So the typical the typical momentum is the temperature, but here I decided to put X if you want to consider, I don't know, a factor of 10 smaller or 10 larger. So yeah, so if I split my free streaming length into uh, the, the distance uh, until the moment of in which the action is non-relativistic, and then from the moment the action is uh, non-relativistic still until the epoch of the CMB still travels a distance which is related, which is very similar, but amplified by, uh, by a log actually. Uh, but okay, if you forget about this log, bo these both terms are of the same order, which is this X zero T zero divided by M. And this is the, this is the time of the universe today. This, this sets the scale. So uh, if you put numbers into this, you, uh, you find something very spectacular, which is this free streaming length is of the order of this 100 megaparsec if the mass of the action, not the neutrino, is put, put is something like one electron volt. So this means that uh, if, if the mass of the, of the action is uh, even smaller uh, by 60 million electron volts, this free streaming length is even longer. So just these actions are moving uh, over distances which are uh, 100 megaparsec or longer, and these are cosmological distances, right? And this has a very important impact uh, in the structure of the universe. So if you look at uh, how matter, or how the galaxies are distributed in the universe, how matter is distributed in the universe, uh, you observe that it, <clears throat> the power spectrum, which, which are you know, the Fourier modes of the distribution of, of matter has this shape. And uh, where this, Typical distance, as you see here, uh, is of the order of 100 megaparsec inverse, right? This is a typical uh, wave number of the Fourier transform of the distribution of dark matter. And these scales are 100 megaparsec. So if uh, axions um, are hot dark matter, this means that uh, 
even if they started in a in a region which was over dense, but right, it was going to form a galaxy, for instance, uh, these axions they have time to get, go away from that galaxy, and therefore, when this galaxy or this region of the universe collapses to form a galaxy, it's going to have less dark matter than if these axions wouldn't have escaped, right? So this <clears throat> this has the implication that um, the the uh, in, in homogeneities of the universe become smaller. Essentially, they, they, they become smoothed by, by the free stream of axions, right? Of course, the, homogeneity, the inhomogeneities that are uh, larger than the free streaming length will not be affected, right? So if I'm looking at a region of the universe, which is very big, had a given amount of dark matter and the axions have not moved, couldn't, couldn't go away from this dark matter, then this is not going to change very much. But if I look at the small galaxy, for instance, uh, which is coming size much smaller than the free streaming length, these axioms that were originally here have escaped. And now this galaxy will, has, will have less dark matter, will, have, will be less massive, and uh, will have less power. So then the number density of these galaxies will be smaller. So the implications of this free streaming length is a decrease of the power spectrum of, of matter fluctuations in the universe. And this is something that we can actually measure very well through a, a variety of proofs, in particular the CMB. Um, uh, so we would just, uh, if we just look at the, if we look at the power spectrum of, of matter using the CMB, for instance, and, and other large scale probes, one can just constrain the amount of matter or the amount of axioms that form part of the cold dark matter of the universe. And uh, this was done uh, in a series of paper by uh, Yvonne Wong and collaborators, also Gerhard Graffin was uh, strongly involved here. Uh, it was also done in parallel with, <clears throat> so here the axioms have the same role than, than thermal neutrinos. So not only uh, axioms are produced thermally in the early, early universe, but also there's a population of thermal neutrinos. And uh, these thermal neutrinos are produced relativistically. And we don't know their mass very well, but we know that it's relatively small. So it could be that, that these neutrinos, they're also hot dark matter, and they have the same uh, impact than the QCD detections that I have, I have described you before. So uh, doing the analysis uh, of, of the, of the um, cosmological data, leaving both the neutrino masses and the axon masses uh, as three parameters, one can constrain the, the axon mass to be, as you can see here, <clears throat> of the order of half um, half a milli electron volt, sorry, half an electron volt, uh, depending on the neutrino masses. You see that also there's some slightly favored pre, uh, value for the for the neutrino masses here, but this is completely, um, but this is, uh, this, this is uh, irrelevant. This is a very small significance. Um, but in the case of the axion, there's always uh, an, a, a lower limit. Okay, can you repeat? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, smooth it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in in this area here, red, um, the um, the abundance of accents is such that they they don't uh, they don't smooth the power spectrum. They don't smooth the dark matter density. Yeah, exactly. And because um, the observations are such that it looks like the dark matter is ultra cold, super cold. So the free streaming length is negligible, right? So this is the, the common um, uh, the, the common um, conclusion of, of all the observations of large scale structure. And uh, including a small component of hot dark matter that has a um, free streaming length will worsen the fit of observations with, uh, um, with predictions. And this is what this uh, this is what exactly this graph is telling you, right? If you go, if you have a lot of action, that, so if if actions exist and have large mass, then we know the abundance of action dark matter is large. So the the contribution of action dark matter, hot dark matter, to the to the cold dark matter, no, so to the dark matter of the universe is large. And here, large could be ten percent or, or twenty percent. Uh, and this was already be significant. So the, this decrease of the power spectrum 
would be significant and we can that that would would spoil uh, the confronting so the confrontation of ex, um, experiments with predictions yeah <clears throat> so so this is what uh, what we have with blank data but actually we look at the future sensitivity of uh, large scale uh, large scale structure surveys like euclid and including Planck, in principle, one could go, one could have sensitivity until here, uh, something like 0.15 electron volts. So just having much, much better data than we had than we had uh, 10 years ago, uh, we could improve the the bound by a factor of five or so. Uh, unfortunately, when you try to reduce the bound on the axial mass, what happens is that the axons are less abundant, right? So for smaller masses. Axons are less abundant, and at some point, your sensitivity uh, is completely lost. And this happens precisely when, uh, so in this range uh, here, where the, um, where the decay constant of is, is such that the decoupling of axons happen around the QCD phase transition, because there's a lot of degrees of freedom in the QCD phase transition. Uh, if, if the axon decouples slightly before, all these degrees of freedom, all these QCD degrees of freedom, reheat in a sense the universe but not reheat the axion so the axion abundance uh, is uh, the, the decreases almost by one order of magnitude as you can see here in, in a very short amount of, of value of fa which is proportional to the axion mass so yeah it's likely that we will never that one can never be sensitive to these uh, axions with this technique uh, and connected to this is the fact that actually uh, axions stop behaving as hot dark matter here and start behaving as uh, dark radiation because uh, they, they don't cluster at all. Um, so uh, so if we insist in, well, if we, when we examine the implications of our population of axions uh, and we consider very small masses, uh, then the, the abundance of cold dark matter, well, the abundance of dark matter has to be very small, right? Because the mass of the axion is very small. And also because I've showed you the, that the, num the number of these axions is, is, very, is very small. In particular, if you consider axions whose mass is smaller than the temperature of the universe today, so these axions are even relativistic today, not, not even at the epoch of the CMB, but even today they would be non-relativistic, right? However, uh, and, and therefore they don't count at all as dark matter, but nevertheless, they are there, they have an energy density and they contribute to the expansion of the universe, and therefore, it can. So, in particular, the CMB is still sensitive. The physics of the CMB is still sensitive to this, uh, to this dark radiation. Uh, this dark radiation is uh, often not expressed in the density of energy, uh, the energy density, but in units of a standard neutrino. Uh, so, uh, we normally divide the energy density in axions by the energy density of a standard neutrino. The, the energy density of a standard neutrino is related with uh, is slightly smaller than the than the photon density today, um, but this is not very relevant. The important thing is the what I what I'm showing here is the the if you, if you now take the axon mass to a very small volume, right? So we will have a thermal population of of axions that is still is able to gravitate and contribute to the expansion of the universe. Uh, and it's going to have some effect on, on the CMB anisotropies that is detectable by, uh, by Planck at this level. And uh, by a next generation CMB experiment that is uh, decades on the go, like this CMB um, fourth generation of experiments, you know, we have um, um, uh, uh, the Planck was the third generation of, uh, of experiments, right? And now we are planning for the fourth generation. And in principle, if everything goes well, we could have sensitivity to detect uh, an extra radiation of, uh, component of extra radiation at the level of uh, 0 0.03. And uh, spectacularly enough, so this is the this is the energy density that would uh, that we would have in axions if axions were actually in thermal equilibrium, uh, but they decoupled just before uh, the electroweak phase transition to so a temperature of 100, um, 100 GeV or so. Uh, so the actions that decouple here, let's say at one TV, um, 
dedicable before all the all the degrees of freedom of the standard model uh, are are uh, dumped into photons. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm. So delta N effective is nothing but a measure of, of the radiation content of some extra relativistic particle, like the case of axioms. And normally it's defined like this. So delta NF. Oh. Is the the density of energy density of axions divided by the energy density of one standard neutrino? Okay, and one standard neutrino uh, has the energy has an energy density which is related to the uh, temperature of photons. But the neutrinos have two spin degrees of freedom. Uh, they are fermions, so they contribute with seven eighths instead of uh, one, and but they have a temperature which is slightly smaller than the temperature of photons by a factor of uh, four elevenths uh, to the to the one third. So, and, and this is because neutrinos decouple before electron positron annihilation. So this is the value of the, this is calculable in the standard cosmology. This is the density of uh, energy in, neutri in one neutrino species. And so, Instead of normal, instead of just showing the, the energy density in axions in electron ball to the fourth, uh, it's customary to use this uh, this normalization, okay? Which is more or less physical, right? It is telling you, it's telling you that look, if if the axions would decouple very late, they would have they would weight more or less like one uh, neutrino degree of freedom, but if they decouple much earlier, there would be something like 3%, uh, sorry, yeah, 3% of it. Always order one. Very good. I think this is very exciting because this tells you that, uh, imagine there's a scenario in which the heating temperature of the universe is huge, 10 to the 10 GV or something like this. So accents are produced, but uh, there is no other degree of freedom in the plasma connected to the standard model than the 107 that we know already. What is uh, the opening between the red and black? I, I did this plot. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, I guess this corresponds to the. Um, the electron positron uh, annihilation, so that, which is the last, and this has to do, I guess, with uh, uh, with the di different uh, scenarios if the axion is coupled to neutrinos or not, or something like this. But, um, but I forgot. Can I answer it to you it later? To also, no? I, th I thought it was uh, related to neutrinos. Because then the, 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 this definition uh, changes a little bit. Um, but I. Um, in principle, not because this is delta and f. So this is this is the typical this is the typical uh, thing that appears right in in the death exactly. But but uh, this is not uh, this is not here. So I think it's related with the. Couple to, to neutrinos or not? That's a very good question. Okay. So um, just wanted to uh, mention um, that uh, there is a very interesting issue related with axons that decouple precisely at the QCD phase transition, because at the QCD phase transition, the, the thermalization rate cannot be calculated in low energy chiral perturbation theory by just interactions with pions. It cannot be calculated by high energy QCD uh, um, because it also at some point the, the non perturbative effects become very large. And um, so for some years, we calculated the relation between the decoupling, the decoupling temperature and FA using actually an extrapolation uh, from, uh, from, the, from the pion uh, absorption rate, uh, which was uh, incorrect, as pointed out by uh, one of the organizers. And very recently, so people have uh, just tried to do a, a more educated e extrapolation. And now it looks like 
I think we can we can go to bed more or less relaxed that this is uh, re that the results are not going to change very much. But nevertheless, uh, the only way to calculate this properly is actually to do a non perturbative lattice QCD calculation, which is at the moment uh, not available. But this is precisely the range that is re uh, relevant for the for the limits uh, that we will get, or for the sensitivity we will get with the next generation of uh, CMB, uh, CMB and large scale structure experiments. Hmm? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And so these are the extrapolations from uh, from both sides, uh, if I if I understand correctly. Yeah. And they they seem to agree very well in the center. Um, but uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it doesn't. So it only it only looks like uh, it it only looks like it makes sense, right? So this, and I think is the is the best educated interpolation that we can make at the moment, but. Uh, but we don't have a we don't have a first principle calculation. So, could there be here a, a funny peak uh, that that we have not foreseen that there is not uh, non perturbative or not? This is something that we can only uh, we can only do well, we can only answer with a proper calculation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it could be exactly. So it could be that this this is not smooth. I mean, the crystal phase transition we know is a crossover, uh, uh, but so it's not a sharp phase transition. But nevertheless, uh, it could there could be it could be a peak here and that would change things. A deep would be more strange. That's very true. Also, yeah, this is 10 or so. Yeah, but, but this still, this is within one order of magnitude agreement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, well, uh, well, okay, yeah. Let's say, okay, uh, my conclusion is I'm, I'm not altogether unhappy about this, uh, but of course I would like to have this calculation as well. Uh, now one can answer, uh, one, can, one can ask also how, how much do I want this calculation, given that, that this range of um, QCD axial masses are already disfavored uh, by astrophysics. Uh, and uh, then I would say, if, if I have to put it, if I have to make a priority list, it will not be number one. Um, but nevertheless, I want to have it. Very good. Um, so if there are no further questions, uh, so this is more or less what I, everything I wanted to say about thermal actions. Uh, perhaps it was too much. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry uh, if you didn't know some, if you, you didn't have a proper education in standard cosmology, but you can, you are always invited to ask, ask, ask. Um, so the outcome is that if the temperature of the universe is sufficiently high, we expect to have accents produced by the thermal plasma. And these abundances are comparable to the thermal abundance of photons, could have been measured, uh, could have a very strong impact in, uh, um, as hot dark matter and could be measurable as dark radiation in the future. So I think these are very exciting prospects. And a very interesting impact in cosmology. But the most interesting impact, in my opinion, is the impact of zero modes. Uh, so let's let's uh, go and talk about them. So I admit, I, I have to admit, I cheated you. Uh, so when I gave you the thermalization rate, it was not the final answer. And this is related uh, with the fact that actually uh, the, the action interactions <clears throat> are, that, are those interactions of a Goldstone boson. And uh, the product, so in the interactions of a Goldstone boson, they have to be, they have to go necessarily to zero when the momentum of this Goldstone particle goes to zero. 
So this is known as the Goldstone Pole. And, um, and this essentially tells you that the matrix element of producing an, a Goldstone boson has to vanish in the limit where uh, Q uh, goes to zero, where Q is the full momentum of the axon, okay? So uh, the thermalization rate that I gave you is, a, is, is okay for a thermal average, but not all axon energies will be thermalized by these interactions. In particular, as you can see from here, uh, axons with a very small energy, with a very small momentum, are going to have a hard time to, in, to interact with the thermal bath because of this Goldstone pole. Exactly, this, this argument is valid for all interactions except for the, for the non-perturbative inter interactions uh, due to the GG tilde. Exactly. So, which is precisely what makes the axon not a Goldstone boson, but a pseudo Goldstone, right? So if the axon would be a Goldstone, would have, would be massless and would have this pole precisely. Uh, there's only one interaction that can change this picture, which is the GG tilde. Well, actually probably WW tilde as well, but, uh, but quantitatively is negligible. So I will mention this, and th this is going to be super important. Uh, GG tilde, uh, is going to be the one the, the, the one interaction that matters here. I'm going to show you that the, the rest of the interactions do not matter at very uh, small energies. I just wanted to well first first of all flash the the, the news. Uh, so I've cheated you at low at low energies. At low energies, axions do not thermalize. Uh, you can see <clears throat> this Goldstone pole, for instance, if you look at the interactions of axions. Uh, with fermions, you can see it very, very nicely because here the interaction of accents with fermions, we have written it, so we have written it as a derivative of the accent field. So when we write the Feynman diagram of this, of this vertex, uh, this is going to be the momentum of the accent. If it's Q, then you have here a Q mu, right? Um, so then when Q goes to zero, this amplitude will go to zero. But also in the accent coupling to two photons, it's not that evident, right? <clears throat> Although it shouldn't surprise you, when the accent has a zero momentum, this operator FF tilde, when F is the photon field, uh, uh, the, the um, electromagnetic field strength. So this is a total derivative. And this total derivative can be, so in the, so when, when I integrate over space time a total derivative, this is equivalent to a surface integral at infinity. And if I'm concerned about local, uh, local observables, this integral at infinity should have no. Uh, no effect whatsoever. So this um, should also give, to zero, give zero. And you can see this, if you write this matrix element, uh, it's a function of the momenta of the photons, momenta one, momenta two, and the polarization uh, vectors of the photons, which are these Vs that I wrote here. So this matrix element is polarization of photon one, sorry, uh, momentum photon one, polarization of photon two, momentum of uh, photon two, uh, polarization of photon two contracted with the epsilon tensor that comes from this uh, white tilde. And uh, since by momentum conservation, uh, K2, so the momentum of this photon has to be equal to the momentum of this photon plus the momentum of the axion. So K2 is equal to K1 plus Q. So this uh, K2, I write as a K1 plus Q, and because of anti-symmetricity, the K1 uh, term, so when you have two terms, K1 contracted with the epsilon tensor, this is zero because of anti-symmetricity, and therefore only you get the factor of Q here. Uh, so again, the matrix element is proportional to Q. Um, is, that, is that okay? Right? So well, you can do this. Uh, so if, you, if it was too fast, uh, you can trust me. The, so this, the dependence of this uh, photon ends up being only uh, through the uh, momentum difference between the two photons. And then when Q goes to zero, this amplitude will go to zero again. So yeah, accents coupling to photons, accents coupling to fermions, uh, these all uh, decouple in the limit when Q goes to zero. Um, in work, <clears throat> there's a subtlety 
which is very fun, uh, which is a lot of fun that we uh, we found in in uh, in a paper when we were trying to to study uh, the th possible thermalization of, of of the condensate of the theorem zero modes of of any axion or axion like particle. We were able to, <clears throat> in principle, you can relate the the ax to the the axion uh, emission rate or absorption rate to the emission rate of photons. Just uh, if you go to the Q equals zero limit, if you look at this uh, this diagram, uh, you can relate the absorption of a photon, sorry, absorption of, a, of an axion to the, um, <clears throat> to the absorption of the photons in the following manner. So the absorption of a photon will be proportional to the, well, this is one of our phase space. Uh, so, sorry, here what I'm doing is just calculating the absorption of an axion that it has a Q, that is it really in the condensate that has a Q equal to the mass uh, and then a zero momentum, right? So just a, uh, an axion at rest. And this we, we did this exercise for an axion at rest. So a photon of energy omega, it, it has a production rate given by gamma C. And then <clears throat> the, product, the absorption of an axion essentially factorizes uh, here. So this, this uh, production uh, is, uh, as I told you, was G squared is the coupling of axons to, axon to photons. Then you have uh, a mass squared that comes from the factor of Q on uh, the amplitude, which is squared goes to Q squared, which is M squared. And this M squared divided by one over M loses one power, but still uh, the production of axons is going to be uh, proportional to the mass of the, of the axion to at least one power. And then here you have a propagator. And this is extremely important because this propagator, if you put it on shell, it also explodes. It has one, potentially, it has one over K, one over Q uh, uh, in the denominator. However, in a, in a plasma, this divergence is cut by the imaginary part of the photon self energy. So the fact that axions, sorry, the, the fact that photons here uh, can be absorbed cuts off the divergence of the propagator. Uh, and then if you put together all the, all the numbers uh, and you do a thermal average over uh, photon energies, what you get is typically uh, that the, the absorption rate of axions is the, the, the thermal absorption rate to T cubed divided by FA by multiplied by this factor, MA divided by uh, the absorption rate of photons. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is and this is crucial. So if if we wouldn't have uh, actually more than more important than the photon mass is actually the photon imaginary part. So the imaginary part of the of the polarization tensor, so the absorption. Uh, if there's no absorption, then this this would be zero, and then uh, for zero momentum actions, this would also blow up, right? Uh, so this propagator would have one over zero, one over zero, if you want. When, when this action, the momentum of this action goes to zero, and then one over Q squared can compensate a Q in the, in the numerator. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So here, this propagator has to be dressed, and then yeah, you, you, can, you can build this in perturbation theory, and uh, the imaginary part is going to be the, the cutoff of this, uh, of this divergence. And this is very interesting because this is not, yeah. So this was just to show that the, the dependence of, of, of with the mass or with Q stays, uh, but what you get in the denominator is not the temperature, but is uh, the absorption. So it's uh, our absorption rate of photons or particles in the thermal bath. Of course, at very high temperature, the, the thermal width of a photon is proportional to the temperature, but also with some um, coupling constants. And at low temperature, this decreases very much. Okay. Uh, but nevertheless, my point here was just to show you uh, that um, the thermalization of very low mass, uh, very low energy ac uh, axions uh, is uh, hindered by this uh, Goldstone pole. And this estimate changes completely the picture that I, 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 I drew before. <clears throat> In particular, well, let's, let's use that um, I'm taking all the, all the constants and all pi's to one to make things simpler. So if you just uh, 
calculate how effective is this uh, absorption or emission rate of axions compared with the expansion of the universe. Uh, what I get now, oh, well, uh, I have to choose some energy scale, right? And I'm going to say that zero modes are those that have energies compared. So the, the lowest energies that I can consider in a universe in expansion are the ones that are that have energies of the order of uh, of the inverse universe time, right? So on the on the only the lowest energies that I consider in in the universe of time t, uh, one over t. Okay, so this is what I'm saying here is that let me consider that uh, this suppression uh, holds, and uh, I'm going to put instead of the axon mass, I'm going to put the Hubble constant. So the Hubble rate, which is the smallest energy uh, at a given time. Uh, so then it's very interesting. The Hubble cancels, and then I get t, t squared divided by FA. So this is the rate at which um, axions at the very smallest momenta would, would uh, interact the thermal bath. And this uh, is of order one uh, when the temperatures are of order of FA. So when we, have, when we are close to the ultraviolet description of axions, but once the temperature goes below FA, this thing becomes of order one. And then the zero modes decouple from the, from the thermal bath. So that's very interesting. So this, this is telling you that um, below the, the, the phase transition, below the energies at which axions, so at all energies at which axions make sense as low energy uh, degrees of freedom, right? So the axion only exists in the low energy effective theory below FA, right? So at all temperatures where axions actually do exist, this uh, thermalization rate is relevant. So the, so this is just to say that the typical condens so the condensates they are never in thermal equilibrium. Although they can have they can have uh, dynamics around the phase transitions. Very good. Uh, another funny uh, funny expression is that if you really use uh, MA, so if you, instead of uh, if we use the the, the the absorption of the content of uh, of a zero mode with uh, energy equal equal to MA. And I calculate this. I make this estimate. I get this <clears throat> ten to the minus ten for FA of of the order of ten uh, to the nine GB. So this again, this tells you this is this is completely ridiculous. Okay. So the the condensates do not thermalize. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, this is for any energy that you want to consider. Uh, Well, it's not massless. Um, the axon mass decreases very fast with temperature. Uh, it's not massless. But yeah, but uh, it would be it would make it even worse, right? So if if, if the axon if you take the, the axon mass to be smaller than the zero temperature value, uh, which I've used here, this number would be even smaller. So um, the main message from this slide is that. If you put the typical values of the energy that you get for zero modes, so what are the typical values for zero modes? The, the axon mass or uh, the Hubble constant, which is the, the uh, by definition the smallest energy that one that you can, that you can have evolution uh, of of a particle. Whatever you put, this the the, the condensate is never in thermal equilibrium. Right? And that is why, if we go back to my first, uh, almost first slide, I can have these two populations at the same time. Because this, this is telling me that axons thermalized, right, at some point in the history of the universe. Uh, but if axons would thermalize, this, uh, this quantity here, so any zero mode should have gone to the thermal distribution, right? If I put an excess amount of axions, once the axion thermalized, they should have, they should have uh, gone down, right? But th this didn't happen. And uh, what, what is actually wrong is this part of the, of the calculation, because I cannot assume that axions at this very small momenta were ever produced by thermal processes, right? So now the story is going to be that uh, these axions uh, are never in thermal contact 
with the universe. So where do they come from? So these are the axiom zero modes. And these are the ones that are going to give us uh, all dark matter. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, Luca was It's a big chapter. <laughs> it's a big chapter. Um, well, let me just use my five minutes. Otherwise, I will, I will never make it in three hours. Um, just a few things about the zero modes. I've, um, so I've already cheated you when I told you that accents thermalize for a temp, uh, with the thermalization rate that I showed you before. But now I've cheated you again. But luckily, you, you had Luca that told me, hey, but there's one exception. Um, so. Um, Action zero modes. So if, even if the action is a goldstone uh, at Q equals zero, uh, it still has some interactions with the standard model. And these are the ones that generate actually the QCD potential. Um, so GG tilde uh, is, uh, so the expectation value of GG tilde or the, um, the, um, yeah, the effects of GG tilde do not decouple in the Q uh, to zero limit. And uh, therefore the axion still interacts with QCD through the GG tilde, even at Q equals zero momentum. Uh, there's only, however, there's one point which is very important. Uh, this, it has already been said uh, by, we have mentioned it a couple of times now, is that um, so essentially the, the height of the QCD potential, so the amount of energy density that the axion can borrow from, from QCD is proportional to this uh, topological susceptibility. And we know that topological susceptibility is due to instantons and instantons are screened at high temperature. And therefore the topological susceptibility is actually an inversely proportional function to the temperature. So at very high temperatures, even this interaction goes away and becomes completely irrelevant, okay? So at very high temperatures, the action is left, the, the zero modes are left alone. But we expect, however, that at some point, this interaction with uh, uh, QCD is going to be relevant. And the history of how actions can be called dark matter is the history of how this interaction becomes uh, relevant. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> and uh, the reason why uh, these axioms are there, so these zero modes are there, is because of uh, initial conditions. Um, so the, the idea is that um, in the typical initial conditions that we consider from the action field, we have zero modes. And these zero modes are going to be processed by the expansion of the universe, and they're going to be today uh, here. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, the abundance of zero modes is fixed by initial conditions, and this means that uh, they are going to be cosmological cosmology and model dependent to some extent. Uh, however, um, despite the fact that it sounds horrible to be dependent on initial conditions, right? Um, we have some a nice handle on, on this. And this is thanks to the uh, U1 symmetry that is supposed to be valid at, high, at very high energies. Um, so the idea, <clears throat> well, here you have the, the, series, the series of thoughts, but uh, the idea is that um, what are the initial conditions of the action field? We don't know exactly, right? Uh, however, but if we assume that the dynamics of the of the ultraviolet theory respects the U1 symmetry, which is what we, we would like to have also at, at low energies, uh, and we take into account that the action is a relevant degree of freedom, a propagating degree of freedom only below energies of the order of FA, uh, then we can assume that um, the action starts being uh, a dynamical degree of freedom after a phase transition, which is the spontaneous breaking of the fetch Queen symmetry at energies of, of the FA. And uh, the action field is going to take the initial conditions precisely at this phase transition, right? But if this phase transition um, is in, in dynamics that are one uh, U1 symmetry preserving, then when the action field takes its vacuum expectation value, uh, it can, uh, it cannot take, so it, it can have democratic uh, initial, uh, so it, it, it doesn't have an, any preferred value for the vacuum expectation value uh, of, of, the, of itself, right? 
because the action potential is essentially zero at very high temperatures. So the action field doesn't know where to go. So when the action field takes initial conditions, it's going to take, uh, it's going to choose a particular value in one particular region of the universe by accident. And in other region of the universe is going to take another value. Uh, and because of causality, these two regions, no, sorry, sorry, these two values, the different regions, they cannot be causally connected if the distance between the regions is larger than the causal horizon, right? So the picture looks more or less like this. After a phase transition uh, in which the U1 symmetry is preserved, we have to have something like this. So this is lives of the universe where I've color coded the value of the accident field uh, from uh, theta equals zero black to theta equals pi in, in white, uh, going, from, uh, going through one or to minus one with blue and red. And this is what I expect exactly after a phase transition. So this region of the universe chose randomly around something around zero, this around uh, minus one uh, and so on, right? So this is my expectation. And uh, yeah, this, when this is more or less the, the horizon size of the universe, and as you see here, the value of the action field is uncorrelated at distances longer than the, than the horizon. And the universe is more or less, so the web of the action field is more or less smooth, okay? You cut me at, at zero. Um, yeah, we will see. Um, yeah, we will see that. But um, but this is the coherence. This is the coherence length of the of the action field. Here, I'm 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 removing the thermal part. I'm looking only at the at the zero modes. You're right. Uh, so if you look at at the full action field, so if you full fledged action field, and if there's a thermal component, the you would see a, a pixelized version of this with a correlation length much longer. Uh, if you if remove the thermal the thermal part, you should see something like this. Uh, very good. <clears throat> so, given this uh, assumption, we have now two very interesting classes of cosmologies and and possible histories for the axiom. Uh, one is uh, which which depend on the moment when uh, cosmic inflation takes place, and uh, <clears throat> in the first case, the Pacheguin symmetry. Uh, Breaking happened uh, happens after inflation. So we have first a period of inflation, and then the Pacheguin symmetry breaks down, and then you have the picture that I've showed you. Uh, in the second picture, which is much more much simpler, the Pacheguin symmetry breaks before inflation, and then inflation takes place. And then inflation, what it does is takes one region of the universe which is causally connected. And therefore, it has been already processed by causal uh, interactions. In particular, it, it has been smoothed and, up, and it blows it up to a size that is bigger than the universe even today. This is what explains why the universe is so homogeneous because it was in causal contact before inflation. Uh, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do to, uh, today to finish the lecture is actually discuss what happens to the axion in this uh, uh, pre uh, sorry, uh, pre inflation you know, before inflation scenario, uh, in which the initial conditions for the action fields are being, so uh, have been homogenized by inflation, right? So inflation has taken this small region here and has blown it up to our universe. So all our universe is now blue. It has the same initial condition for the action fields. And in this case, uh, it's uh, relatively trivial to calculate the evolution of the action field. Uh, because the initial condition is trivial, it's just one value for the action field homogeneous, and uh, and perhaps this uh, we can we can leave for uh, for tomorrow, uh, because now it, this takes for sure uh, ten more minutes.